I hope you're ready to fall in love, you guys, because let me tell you what, you're about to fall in love head over heels for the movie star known as Lauren Bacall. This is Beauty Biography, where every episode we explore the life of an iconic beauty while I create a loosely inspired makeup look. It's a series. This is our 17th episode, number 17. We've been on hiatus for a while, so welcome back to me and welcome back to you, or if this is your first time here, welcome in general. Be sure to check out the playlist in the show notes below so that you can see the other 16 episodes that we've done so far. Little talked about fact. Lauren Bacall was at one point the most famous mistress in the country. Her career and her famous marriage to Humphrey Bogart would one day eclipse that part of her reputation, but there is so much more to Lauren Bacall than her famous romance. Although that is a very juicy part of it all and something we are definitely going to talk about. So without further ado, let's dive in. Almost 100 years ago, a young woman named Natalie Weinstein Bacall walked into a movie theater nine months pregnant. She was super tired of being pregnant. It was super hot outside. And she thought, hey, let me just find a way to pass some time. While she's watching the movie, she starts to feel contractions. And a few hours later, in the morning hours of September 16th, 1924, Lauren Bacall is born as Betty Joan Persky. This makes Betty a Virgo, and yes, we will be referring to her mostly as Betty because that's how her friends and family referred to her, so that's how we're also going to refer to her. Both of Betty's parents were Jewish. This is not something that I actually knew about Lauren Bacall, but both of her parents are Jewish. Her mother, Natalie, was a secretary, and she had been born into a kind of like well-off Romanian family in Romania. However, when Betty's mother, Natalie, was pretty young, just a few years old, her family had, they lived off of a farm, basically. That's how they got their income. Well, there was like a great famine, and so their crops failed, and they decided to come to the United States. So they came to the United States from Romania in 1901, and Natalie's parents worked very hard to like start anew in New York City and they actually ended up opening a pretty successful candy store and that's what they managed and how they made their money. Betty was incredibly close to her mother throughout her mother's life and she was also very close to her maternal grandmother. From her stories as a child you can tell that like her mother and her grandmother really really doted on her. She was completely the favorite of her grandmother's and I can relate because I'm my grandmother's favorite too. While Betty was very close to her mother, the same cannot be said for her father. So her father, William, was like a medical supply salesman and Betty's mother had basically just married him because he told her like how in love he was with her. He was like head over heels for her, blah, blah, blah. Her mother was in her early 20s and she thought, well, I need to get married. So he's good enough. Spoiler alert, he was not good enough. Now, Natalie figured that out pretty quickly. Um, she was very afraid of William, Natalie was, because he had a really bad temper and he was incredibly jealous. So after Natalie gives birth to Betty, she decides really quickly like, okay, not gonna have more kids with this guy because he is like a ticking time bomb. Natalie and William move with Betty to Brooklyn pretty soon after Betty is born. Betty had been born in the Bronx and this is not a very happy time in Betty's childhood. She said that when her father was around, she basically had a lot of nightmares as a kid. She would like wake up in like a dead sweat and imagine that she heard footsteps coming down the hall or the sound of a strap. And she says this is because one time when her father was angry with her, he hit her with a strap. And he also was like very abusive to her mother. Betty's mother thankfully does divorce William, which is great because I mean, Betty remembers him hitting her with a strap and she was only six years old when her parents got divorced. So that means she was literally a small child when he did that, which is horrific. Thank God Natalie had decided to leave William because honestly, I've seen both cases. I've seen, you know, children who like, you know, their mom left their dad because of stuff like this for their sake. And I've seen 
children were like their mom didn't leave their dad even though all this stuff was going on and honestly the children uh, like in the former camp tend to do better than those in the latter camp so it's a really good thing that Natalie decided to leave William because who knows what Betty's life would have been like if Natalie had decided to keep William around. Now, after the divorce, Betty and her mother moved to Manhattan so they could be closer to Betty's family. Natalie changes her name back from her married name, Persky, to Bacall, but Bacall is spelled with one L, and this will be kind of significant a little bit later. For a while, Betty would see her dad on Sundays, and she did say that she really loved him and wanted his approval. She felt like a lot of rejection when he moved out of the house, and you know, she really was searching for him to like be a part of her life. So he would visit her on Sundays for a while, and at one point he gave her a gold watch, and she like treasured this thing so much that she like gave it to her mom to hold on to to keep it safe because it was just like she describes it as like the first like present she ever got, and she just just felt like oh my gosh my dad gave me this watch and she really treasured it a lot but one Sunday when her dad comes to visit he asks her where the watch is well she tells him you know mom has it and he asks her to get it back she does her dad takes the watch and Betty never sees her father in person again Betty's mother is working really hard as a secretary to try to take care of her. She obviously needs some financial support, so her family tries to track down Betty's dad to help with the support, but he is nowhere to be found. Now, since Natalie doesn't have any like financial help from her ex-husband, she has to work a lot, and so that means she has to leave Betty alone in the house a lot, and she really like feels bad about that and does not like it. So at one point, she hires a maid, to like, you know, just so there'll be someone in the house with Betty during the day. Well, when she gets home one day, she finds that Betty has been locked in the closet all day, which is not good. So that idea is kind of shot. So then her next idea is that she's gonna send Betty to this like really good, pretty prestigious boarding school in Terrytown, New York. Now Terrytown is a suburb of New York City. Only problem is Natalie, you know, she has to like be really tight with her finances and she just doesn't have enough money like to be able to do that. However, the good thing that Natalie didn't have a lot of money but she did have a really good family. And so her brother, Betty's uncle Jack, agrees to lend Betty's mother the money so that she can go to boarding school. This boarding school is called Highland Manor and it actually like turns out to be a great time in Betty's life. She said she loved it. She played a lot of sports. She met her best friend Gloria and her mom would visit every Sunday and they would go out to get ice cream sundaes. Now Betty said like every Sunday when her mom came, she would get an ice cream sundae with chocolate ice cream, chocolate syrup, marshmallow sauce, and chocolate sprinkles. So obviously Betty was a bit of a chocoholic. Betty attends Highland Manor for primary school, but when it's time to attend high school, she moves back to Manhattan to go to school, and she starts living with her mom, her grandmother, and her uncle. Sounds crowded, but it's actually the first time that Betty has her own bedroom to herself, which is very exciting for her. Betty's mom still worked, and so her grandmother was the one that did a lot of the cooking, and apparently she was a very good cook. Betty said that no one could make cookies or stuffed cabbage better than her grandmother, and that kind of like made me feel a little bit sentimental because my grandmother also happens to make the best cookies and the best stuffed cabbage. So we have that in common. Now, as a teenager, while she's in high school, Betty becomes obsessed with the theater. She would like get out of school and her and her best friend would go buy a pack of cigarettes and they would like sit up in the balcony at the quote unquote movie house <laughs> and they would watch Betty Davis films. And Betty just describes that she would just be like chain smoking. She would try to finish like the whole pack basically, you know, in one sitting and her mom would get super mad when she she would, you know, get home and she would smell like cigarette smoke and she'd try to lie to her grandmother, but you know, her grandmother and her mother always like con on to it. So at this time, you know, with Betty Davis as her absolute icon, she decides like, oh, this is what I wanna do. 
I want to become an actress. And she said what really drew her to it is she just thought like, oh, I want that life of being an actress. Now, she didn't actually want to be like a cinema actress. She really wanted to be a theater actress, like in the theater in New York City. At one point, Betty actually meets her icon, Betty Davis, and that really just like doubles down her resolve. So she auditions for, when she's 15 years old, she auditions for and she is accepted to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City. Now, when I was preparing this, I watched a lot of like different interviews that Betty did. And in one interview, she actually talked about like a report card that she had gotten from her time at the Academy of Dramatic Arts. And she literally reads off and shows you like the report card. And it's hilarious. They say, and I'm gonna quote here, blonde, good proportions, pleasing personality, voice low, New York regionalism. And this is a quote, Jewish but does not look it. And when Betty reads this, she just laughs. I mean, she had a really good sense of humor because I would be offended if I was Jewish and someone said that about me. But she just kind of laughed it off and I think it's just, you know, probably a sign of the times. Betty's mom can only afford one year of tuition at this school, but that does not discourage Betty. She gets a job working as an usher. Like she's seen her mom work hard her whole life. So to her, like hard work doesn't scare her. Now, funny enough, while she's working as an usher, she actually is spotted by Gregory Peck, kind of like she meets him in passing and he literally remembers her face because she is just so striking. She's very beautiful, she's tall. She's got like this beautiful like rectangle, angular face. And so her face kind of sticks in his memory. And it's funny because he's actually gonna recognize her later on when she gets to Hollywood and they are going to become pretty good friends. Now, like I said, Betty at this point, she does not think she's gonna go into film or Hollywood. She thinks like her place is on the stage in New York. However, fate has other plans and a series of unlikely events are soon set into motion that will see a big Hollywood break for our aspiring Broadway Betty. Now, like we said, Betty is nothing if she's not hard working. So she begins to model. She says, okay, this is a good way for me to get more money. That's what it's all about for acting. Modeling is like her way. It's not to her like a stepping stone. To her, it's just, this is how I'm gonna get more money and maybe get some people to look at me. She doesn't want to model as a career, but she's gorgeous and tall. And like I said, that angular bone structure is so beautiful. So that really like gets people's attention. Now, while working as a model, there's one night where Betty goes to a club in New York City called Tony's. And while she's there, she meets a man named Nicholas de Gunsberg. Nicholas de Gunsberg has like this incredible like life story basically. So he is a Russian Jewish French Baron who is also like an oil and banking scion. Like that's where his family got all of their money. But he's also an editor for Harper's Bazaar. So he sees Betty out at the club one night, Tony's, and he tells her, come to my office tomorrow. I'm gonna get you in the magazine. Now you may be thinking like, okay, like there's no way this guy's gonna like pull through. It definitely sounds sketchy, but sure enough, Betty goes and he follows through. So Nicholas introduces her to Diana Vreeland, who was like a fashion magazine legend and Diana Vreeland sets it up for Betty to be photographed in Kodachrome, which was like Kodak's first like color film. The photographs turn out beautifully and Betty becomes the cover girl of the March 1943 cover of Harper's Bazaar. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, a woman named Slim Hawks, who is like a super incredibly important and high society socialite, she is married to a Hollywood producer and director named Howard Hawks. Now, Slim sees this cover with Betty on it and she thinks, wow, like that girl has got it. So at the time, her husband is in the middle of looking, he's like in pre-production stages, looking for cast for a film he has coming up called To Have and To Have Not. So Slim tells her husband, Howard, 
you need to get this girl from New York and you need to get her in a screen test because she would be perfect in this movie. Now here's where this goes from like unlikely events to just like a straight up like clerical error, like mishap mistake almost. So Howard Hawks is like, okay, sure. But he's, you know, he still wants to know more. So he tells his secretary like, hey, can you get me some more information about this girl that's on the cover of Harper's Bazaar? Well, his secretary kind of misunderstands him or who knows, maybe Slim kind of like stepped in and leaned on the secretary a little bit because his secretary ends up interpreting it as oh fly this girl from new york to hollywood so sure enough the secretary sends betty a ticket from new york to los angeles so that she can audition for this part and to have and have not for what it's worth, Howard Hawks doesn't actually end up getting upset at his secretary because as soon as he meets Betty in person, he is like captivated. He thinks she's like the best thing since sliced bread and he signs her to a contract and not just any contract, a seven year contract, <laughs> which is just so funny because if you've ever watched any other beauty biographies, you will know that for some reason at this time in Hollywood, they really, really liked seven year contracts. Howard begins to like personally manage Betty's career because he just thinks she's, again, gonna be something huge and he's not wrong. He also probably had a crush on her, but Betty was really oblivious to that. She's 19 years old. She's just not super street smart when it comes to Hollywood yet. So first order of business is that Howard decides Betty needs a stage name. Now for her first name, he picks Lauren, but for her second, like her surname, he lets her pick and she decides she wants to use her mom's maiden name, Bacall, but instead of one L, she's gonna use it with two Ls. So Betty Bacall with one L becomes Lauren Bacall with two Ls, or technically three Ls if you count the L in Lauren. So one L plus two Ls equals three Ls. Howard's wife, Slim, she also takes Betty under her wing. She teaches her like manners and how to dress elegantly and stylishly. And honestly, Betty could not have asked for a better teacher. We could do a whole beauty biography on Slim Hawks because she lived an incredible life. She actually later becomes an aristocrat. She's also often referred to as the original California girl. So yeah, Slim Hawks was like an incredible person to have teaching Betty manners and, you know, allocution and those kinds of things. However, let's, let's not forget, Betty is here to act and she's having a little bit of a problem because she's getting really nervous about her audition for to have and have not. So much so that when it's time for Betty to screen test for the film, she's like, physically shaking and she doesn't know what to do about it. So she kind of has this idea. She like dips her chin down to like steady it so that she's not shaking. And she looks up at the camera. Trust me when she does it, it looks way better. This look actually becomes like her signature look and it's literally just born from her incredible nerves. Despite her nerves, Betty lands the part. She is cast as the female lead and to have and have not, which is actually an adaptation of an Ernest Hemingway book. Funny enough, the reason this movie is made is because Ernest Hemingway was kind of like being a little bit stubborn about not wanting his books to be adapted into movies. So his friend, Howard Hawks, is like, listen, just give me a shot. I promise I can turn your worst book into a great movie. And they agreed that his worst book was to have and have not. One of these differences is that in the film, the two lead characters played by Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart have the names Steve or the nicknames Steve and Slim respectively. These are actually Howard Hawks and his wife Slim's nicknames for each other. And Howard just decided to incorporate it into the screenplay. This little tidbit of cinema trivia actually becomes relevant again almost 80 years later when in the spring of 2022, we're like all captivated by the Heard versus Depp or Depp versus Heard trial. And during that trial, it's revealed that Heard and Depp actually used to refer to each other as Slim and Steve as a reference to that 1944 film. That's a story for a different video and actually for a completely different channel though. We're not gonna get into that. Anyway, we're going back to 1944 where we have Betty playing Slim and Humphrey Bogart playing Steve. 
So when filming begins on To Have and To Have Not, Betty is 19 years old and this is her first you know, major motion picture role. She's playing opposite Humphrey Bogart, who is well established by this point as one of the like biggest actors in Hollywood ever, <laughs> and he still is. So obviously it's not surprising that she has, you know, a lot of nerves about this. She's, this is her first big picture. It's a lot of pressure. However, from the moment that Betty meets Humphrey Bogart or Bogey, as he's often known by his friends and family, he completely tries to put her at ease. He like tries to keep things light. He's like very like gentle and you know, as far as acting goes, <laughs> he's very gentle and understanding and patient and you know, makes a lot of jokes and jokes around with her a lot. So she, he really just like makes it easier for her. But also it doesn't hurt that as soon as they meet, they immediately have like this incredible chemistry. Like she just finds him to be so charismatic and he obviously thinks she's gorgeous. So they just automatically really hit it off. Now, you know, he's 45 years at this point and she is 19, but that's not the biggest problem we have here. The biggest problem we have here is that Ogie is married. Yes, he is married and Betty really does try to resist the chemistry, not just because of the principle of the fact that he's married, but because Bogie's wife at the time was Mayo Mathot and she was an actress who had a very chaotic personal life. Other people on the set tell Betty that, you know, Mayo hallucinates a lot. Um, she's very paranoid. And if she even thinks that you're having an affair with Bogie, she will drop a lamp on her head. So Betty, you know, definitely doesn't want to get a lamp dropped on her head. So she, she really tries to resist this. Now I will say we have no way of knowing like the exact dynamics and what was going on behind closed doors between Bogey and Mayo. But most people do at least acknowledge that Mayo did have an extreme drinking problem. She was an extreme alcoholic. And she also at some point was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. One of their mutual friends referred to their marriage, the marriage between Bogey and Mayo as being quote, the sequel to the civil war. So it was pretty, not healthy marriage. Now, despite their best efforts to resist whatever it is that they're feeling for each other, the two do begin an affair while they are filming. They start meeting in secret on Bogey's boat at like two, three, four in the morning. Like they just cannot stay away from each other. Now, Betty's living with her mother in Hollywood at this point, and Betty's mother is horrified that Betty is having this affair. She does not like Bogey. You know, he's married, number one, and she just feels like he's too old for her. In spite of that, Betty is in love and there's really like no turning back at this point. Their affair is going full steam. And in 1944, their movie To Have and To Have Not is released and it is just as hot as their affair. It is a huge, huge hit. Gregory Peck happens to see the movie and he instantly recognizes Betty from her days as an usher. With the film's release, Lauren Bacall becomes a fan favorite and a critic favorite overnight. Like critics praise her debut. They think she's gonna be like the next Katherine Hepburn. Everyone is talking about her. She is instantly a huge deal in Hollywood and across the US. Women want to be her, men want to be with her, but she only has eyes for Bogey. However, much to her chagrin, after filming ends, her affair with Bogey stops cold and she doesn't know why and it drives her absolutely crazy. That makes things pretty uncomfortable when at the end of 1944, she starts filming for The Big Sleep, another film where she is starring opposite Bogey. So when filming begins, obviously a little uncomfortable, they've had this like hot and heavy affair and then everything has stopped cold turkey. Bogey feels like, okay, he needs to explain himself to Betty. And so he tells Betty the truth, which is that his wife, Mayo, has sworn to get sober. Like she swears she's gonna get sober, things are gonna be okay. And he feels like he owes it to her to give her that chance. 
he tries that, but to be honest, Mayo relapses several times and then also Bogey relapses and gets back together with Betty. So during the filming of The Big Sleep, Betty and Bogey's affair is on again, off again, on again, off again, and it's really, truly kind of becoming a problem for everyone around them. You know, like this pattern is not helpful to filming, so much so that it starts to threaten Betty's career. Howard basically tells her like, you've got to stop this. You are gonna lose your contract. You're gonna lose your career. Like you cannot be doing this. The emotions are spilling over into work basically. For example, there's one day where like, right as the day starts, Bogey comes in and he lets Betty know that he's gone back to Mayo. And this devastates Betty so much that she's just like sobbing uncontrollably, but she has to act that day. So she literally has to like go into her dressing room and dunk her face in ice cold water to like, bring down all the puffiness from her face. You know, I'm just gonna say, as someone who has 100% had to dunk my face in ice water to like bring down all the puffiness from crying over the love of my life, <laughs> I can relate. Stars, they're, they're just like us. Again, Howard is so worried about this like destroying Betty's career that he actually tries to set her up with Clark Gable, but she's like, there's no chemistry. She goes on a date with Clark Gable at his prime and says, you know, no, I'm not interested. So obviously she is very, very in love with Bogey. Finally, in the spring of 1945, Bogey leaves his wife Mayo for good and Mayo also agrees to a divorce. Now, as part of the divorce settlement, they're gonna split everything 50-50 and Mayo has to go to Reno for six weeks to live. At first I was like really confused. I could not figure out like, why does she have to go to Reno? What, what's the deal with that? But as I've come to understand it, basically if they were gonna get divorced in California, it would have taken a really long time. And one of the few places that had like quickie divorces at the time was Reno. And so in order for them to get divorced in Reno, one of them needed to establish residency in Reno. Obviously Humphrey is working a lot, like he's got, you know, the big sleep he's just finished filming. They still haven't come out with To Have and To Have Not yet. So they filmed it, but it's not yet out. And so they have to go on this press tour for it. So because of that, he can't go to Reno. Mayo can though, because she's not working because of her alcoholism and schizophrenia. So Mayo says, yes, I will go to Reno for six weeks and then we can get our divorce. And Bogey, for his part, decides, all right, it's time. And he proposes to Betty. Betty accepts his marriage proposal and it has one condition from Bogey and that's just that he doesn't want her to have to film on location. So he doesn't want her having to like go outside of Hollywood to film movies on location. He's like, you know, keep working, but I want you to be at home. He's 45 years old. He's not had any kids at all. And you know, now that he's met Betty, he's thinking, okay, like this could be a possibility. I can finally have a family and a wife at home. So he doesn't want her to be working on location. This doesn't bother Betty. She's happy, thinks it's a great idea too. And so they agree that they're going to get married. So before they can get married, we've got to get this like six weeks in Reno knocked out. During the six week period that Mayo is over there in Reno trying to get citizenship for, you know, their quickie divorce, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren McCall have to go on the press tour for the movie To Have and To Have Not. Their press tour actually starts in New York City. And because of this, Betty gets to meet some of Bogey's like New York friends and Bogey gets to meet Lauren's very large extended family. Now, like we said, Betty's mother really didn't like Bogey because you know, one, he was married, two, he was 25 years older, and number three, he is not Jewish like Betty and all of her family. But during this trip, Bogey does manage to win over Betty's family, including her beloved mother. When the press tour is over and the six weeks are up in Reno, Mayo and Bogey finally get to a divorce and almost immediately after, Betty and Bogey get on a train to go to Ohio where they're gonna get married at the Malabar Farm in Lucas, Ohio. This is a farm that's owned by one of Bogey's really good friends, Louis Bromfeld, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning author who basically left writing to go start this farm adventure. And his farm actually becomes like this really popular getaway for Hollywood stars at the time. And that's where Bogey and Lauren get married on May 21st, 1945. Later on census records, Betty will list herself as Betty Bogart. So Betty and Humphrey Bogart, the newlyweds, 
they head back to Hollywood and Betty's next film out is Confidential Agent. Now, Confidential Agent is a big flop. So as much of a success as To Have and To Have Not was, that's how bad of a flop Confidential Agent was. Now, Betty felt like she had been miscast, but not only that, it was her third film that she had ever filmed and the director just, they didn't mesh. He didn't give a lot of direction. And so Betty just couldn't ever figure out what was wanted from her or what the role needed. And so the critics like absolutely pan her to the point that she's like worried her career is over and it actually does hurt her career for quite a while. Luckily though, her next film out is The Big Sleep, the film that her and Bogey had filmed together, their second film together. This is a film noir and it is a huge success. It revives her career. This film will actually be the film that kind of sets the tone for Betty being seen as a femme fatale, if you will. She's often cast as the femme fatale from here on out, similar to her character in this movie, who was named Vivian. Betty appears in two more films with Bogey, Dark Passage in 1947 and Key Largo in 1948. Now, in the early 1950s, Betty begins to develop a little bit of a reputation for being difficult. And this is because after her experience on Confidential Agent, she just decided, you know what? I have to be able to have some say in the roles that I'm doing. And so if she did not like a script, she didn't vibe with the script, she would turn it down. And as we all know, you know, difficult is kind of a key word for women who refuse to do something that a man is wanting them to do. So it pays off that she's picky though because she has a string of really well-received performances in Brightleaf, Young Man with a Horn, and one of my all-time favorite movies, How to Marry a Millionaire. How to Marry a Millionaire stars Lauren Bacall alongside Marilyn Monroe and Betty Grable. They play three discerning women looking for men of substantial means to fall in love with. So what we would probably call nowadays as gold diggers. The movie is hilarious. It's like comedic gold and all three ladies do incredible with their performances and Betty is especially praised. The film is also a huge box office success. It is the fourth highest grossing film of 1953, which actually puts it three spots ahead of another film that co-star Marilyn Monroe was in that year, which was Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which was only the seventh highest grossing film of 1953. So How to Marry a Millionaire, huge, huge film success. By the time How to Marry a Millionaire was released, things are going really great on the home front for Betty Bacall and Betty, or I guess Betty Bogart, as she would say. She and Bogey have had two children, a son, Stephen, who was born in 1949, and a daughter, Leslie, who was born in 1952. Betty talks in her book about how this was such a time of joy for them. Like she would bring the children to visit Bogey on set. They just had this beautiful family they built together. And honestly, it was a family that Bogey, he never really expected to have. You know, by the time Bogey met Betty, he was 45 years old. And so he thought that having a family and a wife and kids had passed him by. So here we come to the point, and this happens in every beauty biography, but unfortunately for Betty, it happens a little earlier than we would want. And that is that point where I really start to connect with Betty and something terrible is going to happen. <laughs> I've said it before, I'll say it again. Every time I do a beauty biography, every time we sit down and we, you know, learn about a new beauty, we fall in love, you know? And not only do we fall in love, we find a part of our story and their story. We see parts of their journey that really resonate when we think about our own journeys. It just helps us kind of see like how much more we have in common than we do different. This is the part of Betty's life where I found that common thread. Now, my husband is not 25 years older than me. He's 14 years older than me, but he just turned 40 when we started dating and we didn't have kids until he was 43. So I really relate to this. I see my own love story and family in Betty's. That is why this next chapter of Betty's life absolutely broke my heart. So it's 1955, Betty and Bogey have two young children, but Bogey's health is kind of starting to decline and no one's really sure why. He's always been a cougher, Betty says, but he has a cough that just like absolutely will not go away. Like it's getting really bad. And he's also having a really hard time getting food down and eating. He always was a picky eater, but again, it's just getting a lot worse. Betty pleads with Bogey to go to a doctor, but he does not like doctors and he just kind of keeps putting it off until one day Bogey's like out at lunch. 
he runs into like an old friend of his and the friend is like, listen, you're not well. There's something wrong here. And she literally drags Bogey, this friend does, to her own doctor to get some tests. So after a lot of tests <laughs> and a lot of biopsies, in January of 1956, Bogey, who was a lifelong like heavy smoker and drinker, is diagnosed with cancer of the esophagus. Several weeks after this diagnosis, Bogey has surgery to remove his esophagus, two lymph nodes, and a rib. Following this, he gets x-ray, or what we would now call like back then the version of radiation therapy that they had. However, the radiation and the surgery are not successful at fully eradicating the cancer. And so he has to begin doing something called nitrogen mustard, which was one of the earliest forms of chemotherapy. Now you can imagine how, you know, chemotherapy makes people like really sick these days. You can imagine how sick it made people back then because they just, you know, it was not nearly as advanced. This becomes just a really difficult time in Betty and Bogey's life, but Betty and Bogey are not thinking like Bogey's gonna die. They're just thinking Bogey's sick and we're just gonna have to keep trying things and then he's going to get better. So while he's sick, he encourages Betty to star in the film Designing Woman opposite Gregory Peck. Gregory Peck had actually like personally asked the studio for Lauren Bacall. And so the film wouldn't be released until 1957, at which point it is a critical success and it wins like an Academy Award for its screenplay and Betty gets highly praised by critics. I think it was really selfless that Bogey wanted Betty to have time out of the house and for her career at this time, even though he was very sick. His cancer continues to spread, it continues to get worse, and then in November of 1956, he has to have another operation. While I was reading Betty's autobiography, she talks about how this was just such a difficult time. I mean, she talks in great detail about how far Bogey's health declines, but she speaks of it very matter-of-factly because she says repeatedly that it just never occurred to her that he was dying. It never occurred to her. She really just felt like, oh, he's going to get better at some point. Like, is this the point where he starts to get better? She tries to like keep his hopes up and everything. They would often have friends over to visit for happy hour because Bogey was unable to leave the house. Frequent visitors included Frank Sinatra as well as Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn. Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn were together, but they didn't really tell anyone because Spencer Tracy was still and would remain married until he died. So they kept their relationship, you know, pretty under wraps and going to Betty's and Bogey's for cocktail hour was one of the few places they would go out together. Now after Bogey's second surgery, he had begun sleeping in the bed alone because he needed a nurse around the clock. So Betty had started sleeping like in the sitting room portion of their master bedroom. There was like little doors between, they had a sitting room and then their like bedroom bedroom. So she would sleep in the sitting room while Bogey slept in the master bedroom. However, on the night of January 12th, 1957, Bogey asks Betty to come sleep with him, and so she does. And she just describes that he has this horrible night. Basically, like he's just like trying to tear out of his skin, basically, like picking at his chest, like he just like wants to get out of his own body. So anyway, the next day, Bogey tells his doctors, like, I can't take another night like that. I, I just can't do it. And you know, Betty's like beside herself at how bad this is because she knew, she knows it's bad, but she had spent the whole night before with him and she just knows that he is truly suffering and truly miserable. So she doesn't wanna leave him alone for long. She tells him, you know what, I'm gonna go pick up the kids from Sunday school. I'll be back in like 20 minutes. She goes to get the kids from Sunday school and when she gets home, Bogey has slipped into a coma. Humphrey DeForest Bogart died in the early hours of the next day, Monday, January 14th, 1957. He was 57 years old and his new widow, Betty, was 32 years old. I am 32 years old and I have two children. And let me just tell you what, that is one of the worst nightmares I can imagine. Betty had a lot of people around her to support her at that time though. Her mother was still alive. Her mother came to be with her. You know, she had a lot of support and Bogie's funeral was attended by like, honestly like so many stars that I can't 
even name them all it would just we would be here forever it's like anyone that was anyone came now betty for her part she asked publicly for no one to send flowers like do not send any flowers please instead make donations to the american cancer society now after the funeral betty comes home and some of her closest friends come with her and they're opening telegrams and cards with condolences and so she opens one from the american flora society and she's expecting to get like another condolence or something but instead she opens this card and she reads do we tell people not to go to lauren bacall movies <laughs> betty said it was the best laugh she had during the entire time of that whole funeral thing was just like laughing at the fact that the florist association was like where do you get off telling people not to send flowers lady like this could have been a big windfall for them you know humphrey bogart huge star you know that would have been a lot of flowers and again, this is something that I just really related to because I can remember when my grandfather passed, you know, there were so many sad moments, but some of the moments that I remember the most really were the ones where it was like little moments of humor that we could find among the grief and the despair. So I feel like that's a pretty, a pretty universal thing that happens. And I think it's amazing that Betty shared stories like this in her autobiography. If you have never read it, it's really worth reading. She shares so many stories and she is an incredible storyteller. So following Bogie's death in the late 50s and throughout the 60s, Betty did not work much in Hollywood. Instead, she starts focusing on her family life. She takes care of her children. She also starts dating. She actually dates one of Bogie's close friends, Frank Sinatra, who at one point proposed to her, but then broke it off because he thought that she had linked it to the press. She had not leaked it to the press. It was actually someone else, but Frank didn't find that out until many years later. And by then it was too late. Although Betty said that that was definitely for the best because it just probably wouldn't have been the best marriage. Even though it wouldn't have been the best marriage at the time, it did break Betty's heart a bit. So she decided she needed to go back to New York where she was from so she could be closer to extended family. And also so that she could see finally once and for all if she could make it in the theater. That was her original dream. She appears on Broadway in Goodbye Charlie in 1959. And while she's there in New York, she meets another married actor named Jason Roberts. Her and Jason start another affair and they end up getting married in 1961. They had one child together. He was born in December of that same year. And while being the other woman had worked out for her with Bogey, it didn't quite work out so well with Jason. She ends up divorcing him in 1969 and she cites his alcoholism as the main cause for their separation. That same year that she divorces Jason, her beloved mother Natalie passes away and Betty said it's something she never ever got over. Her mother had done everything in her power to give her a good life and she succeeded. Betty McCall's life comes full circle when in 1970, she earns the lead role in the Broadway musical Applause. Applause was a musical version of the film All About Eve. If you recall, All About Eve starred Betty Davis, who was Betty McCall's idol. Betty Davis actually comes to see Applause and she comes backstage and she tells Betty McCall, no one else could have played that part but you. This is a very rewarding time for Betty Bacall because she realizes like she could make it in the theater and she did. A few of Betty's notable roles in the 1970s films include Murder on the Orient Express, which was a star-studded movie adaptation of Agatha Christie's novel of the same name, as well as the 1976 film The Shootist. John Wayne actually asked for Betty Bacall, or Lauren Bacall, by name, yet again, you know, she's handpicked by the lead actor. This was going to be John Wayne's last film. He was very ill and he knew it. And so it's a big honor that he chose her to be the leading lady in this film. Betty and John Wayne had actually become really good friends, even though they were very different people. Betty was a staunch like New York liberal Democrat and John Wayne was very solidly a Republican, but they actually had a really nice friendship. And at the time when they were filming The Shootist, John Wayne, he had some difficulty completing the filming. And that really reminded Betty a lot of Bogie's struggles in his last years. And so she had a lot of compassion for John that I think really, really helped him on the set of that film. Actually, he called her Betty and she called him by his name that he was known in Hollywood by amongst his friends which was 
Duke. Betty appeared in a couple films in 1980 and 1981, but then she takes a seven year break from films to star in the musical Woman of the Year, as well as several other Broadway shows. Betty returns to film and supporting roles in the late 80s, but she makes a resurgence in 1990 with a small but vital role as Jane Can's agent in the 1990 film Misery, which was based on the Stephen King novel of the same name. After Misery, she stars in several television movies movies, including one with her dear friend Gregory Peck called The Portrait. Then again in 1996, yet another big moment for Betty comes when Barbara Streisand chooses Betty Bacall to play her mother in The Mirror Has Two Faces. The reviews are glowing, and for the first time ever, Betty Bacall is nominated as Lauren Bacall for the Best Actress in a Supporting Role Award. She is highly, highly favored to win, but in the end, Juliette Binoche wins for The English Patient. Let's be real though, who really won? Who really won? Because you know what? Who remembers Juliette Binoche? No one does. And who remembers Lauren Bacall? All of us do. No shade to Juliet. We should all lift each other up, but seriously, it really angered me to figure out that Lauren Bacall never won an outright Academy Award because she should have. She 100% should have. And in my opinion, she's probably the best actress who's never actually won one. Betty is going to get her flowers though, okay? Don't worry. In 1997, she receives the Kennedy Center Honors. She is voted as one of the 25 most significant female movie stars in the history of film by the American Film Institute. And she comes back into style. She appears in several high profile movies and supporting roles. She stars in a Broadway revival of Waiting in the Wings, and she becomes a spokesperson for High Point Coffee, Fancy Feast Cat Food, and Carnival Cruise Lines. She also makes an incredible cameo in The Sopranos in 2006, where she gets robbed by Christopher Molisanti. You gotta watch the episode, it is so good. Betty goes on to win the Katherine Hepburn Medal, which is awarded by Bryn Mawr College. And then at the inaugural Governor's Awards in November of 2009, Betty receives an honorary Academy Award. And while no one has deserved it more, Betty never thought she was entitled to it. In fact, she never thought she was entitled to anything. In a 1996 interview with the New York Times, Betty had said, you just learn to cope with whatever you have to cope with. I spent my childhood in New York, riding on subways and buses. And you know what you learn if you're a New Yorker? The world doesn't owe you a damn thing. On August 12th, 2014, one month before her 90th birthday, Betty Bacall suffered a stroke at her longtime home in the Dakota on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. She passed away peacefully at the age of 89 years old. A small family funeral was held in Manhattan and her remains were later interned with Bogey at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. Years prior to her death, she had expressed that she felt lucky that she had known the privilege of older age, a luxury her beloved Bogey had not been afforded. She said, quote, I had one great marriage, I have three great children and four grandchildren. I am still alive, I can still function, I can still work, end quote. What a good reminder to us all that the truest luxuries we have are our loved ones and our health. Back when Bogey's health was failing and he had encouraged Betty to film Designing Woman with Gregory Peck, he had one day visited the set and it was one of the few days he could get out of the house and he told Gregory Peck, you know, Betty comes home and takes care of me every night after working a full day. He told Gregory, quote, that's how you can tell the ladies from the broads. Honestly, when I saw Gregory Peck tell that story, I started to cry because <laughs> the whole time I was researching Betty Bacall, I just kept thinking, what a broad. You know, just like in the best, most complimentary sense of the word, you know, I'll never know if Humphrey Bogart meant that like she was a lady or she was a broad. In my mind, she's a broad, but like in that like very complimentary way. You know, Betty said the world owes us nothing, but I am so glad that she got the fulfilling life that she deserved and one of the greatest romances of all time. As Betty once said about her and Bogie's life together, no one has ever written romance better than we lived it. 
And maybe you're thinking, Ashley, how was that a great romance? You know, it ended tragically. It started with an affair. There are a lot of things that maybe would make one think that that's not like the romance of the century. But honestly, finding the person that you love most against all odds is something that does not happen to everyone. So being able to find them, you know, not only find them, but spend years with them building a life together is a miracle in and of itself. And even if that miracle is sometimes more brief than we would hope, that doesn't make it any less magical. So from where I'm standing, and I think from where she was sitting too, Betty McCall had a pretty magical life. I hope to see you in the next episode of Beauty Biography. Let me know in the comments, who should we fall in love with next? Until then, take care of yourself.